All right, good morning. This is Dr. Tom Knotts, and I want to thank you for joining me in this uh, study on Revelations. Today we're going to look at the letter to the church of Sardis. I've titled this message, Being Wheat in the Midst of Tares. Um, i got to admit, when I did this breakdown, uh, I do an ideological research where I break each word down in the original language, uh, which for this, the Greek, but also when there's referencing being made, it's either in the Hebrew and there's 17 verses in Daniel 4 for the Aramaic. So you're going to see the Hebrew and the Greek broken down here and all tied together. I got to tell you, when I broke this one down, it's the most sobering message I think I've ever seen in my life. Um, it hit me very hard. I would compel you, I would urge you and, and plead with you to take this message seriously and to begin witnessing to others in a way that confronts them on their Christianity, the validity of their Christianity. The Bible tells us to make sure our calling of election. The word election doesn't mean calling or chosen for salvation. It always means chosen for service. If somebody's not serving God and living for God, it's because God's not living in them. They're one of the Sardins. Or they're a member of Sardis, which means the red ones. So I'm going to begin with a passage in Matthew. Uh, the Lord tells us in Matthew uh, 13, 24 through 30, he says, Another parable put he, Jesus, forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in the field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. You see, the thing is, is tares and wheat look exactly alike. Um, I've got a, a book on plants. I research everything when I research the scriptures. And as I was looking at tares and wheat, um, what was really interesting is you cannot tell the difference between tares and wheat until they begin to produce fruit. And by then it's too late because a tear will always grow right next to a wheat. Because a tear cannot support itself by itself. Um, it has to grow with something that is able to sustain itself. Wheat, on the other hand, is designed because it's like the Lord Jesus Christ. He's that which springeth up out of dry ground, and we are grafted in. He is strong enough to support us. So tares will grow right next to wheat, and they will wrap the root around. They will grow over, wrap the root around the wheat. And what they do is they become, it's a symbiotic aspect, except there's no giving to the wheat. So it's more like a, a succubus or a lamprey or something that feeds off of the wheat. It will actually take the nutrition from the wheat and begin starving it. And by the time they're ready to produce fruit, the wheat will begin dying because when the tear goes to produce its seeds, it'll suck the actual life. By that time, it's broken through and into the plant and grown up into it. And it'll take the life out of it. That's the way an unbeliever is. They look just like true believers. They act like them. But only God, the true husbandman, can tell the difference. And you see, a true farmer, they can tell the difference. But to the untrained eye like mine, I couldn't tell the difference. And um, you have to know exactly what you're looking for uh, to be able to tell them apart. So the servant said, when the blade sprang up and brought forth fruit, he didn't notice it until it began putting out the seed. There appeared the tares also. He says, listen, didn't you buy good seed for your field? I mean, seed that you knew was, because they were very meticulous when they would take wheat seeds. They didn't do a bunch at a time. They would do one plan at a time. That way they, honest truth, that way they knew they weren't getting tares. When you do it all together on a big threshing floor on the top of the hill, you get tares and wheat mixed together. And when you grind it, the tares will stick to the grinder. They'll stick to your cloth. You can get rid of them rather easily because they do the cloth like this and the wheat will bump up and, and the wind will blow the chafe away. But the tear will actually stick to the cloth and that's how they can cleanse it and separate it. It's in the threshing. And you see it's at the judgment seat of Christ where the tares will be separated from the wheat. He says... From whence then do you have these tears? He says an enemy's done this. And you see, the enemy is, is Satan. And he will give people the spirit of Antichrist or pseudo Christ, pseudo Christoi. And what it means, it's a false Christ. I counsel people 
And I'm telling you, it, it used to be like one out of every four or five had a false Christ 30 years ago. But nowadays, it's over 90% of the people I see have a false Christ. Now, because of my heart condition, I can only counsel maybe one or two people. I can only give one or two hours a week now. Um, so please continue to pray for my heart's healing. But the thing is, is the majority of the people I'm seeing, the reason why they're having so much problems in their life is they have a false Christ. They've never been truly born again. The God of this world has blinded their mind. They can't even see the truth. That's why it's so important that we stand for the faith and confront people about their sin. You can't love people into the kingdom of Christ. You say, well, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Yes, he did. And how did he show that love? He convicted you of your sin and of your unrighteousness. He showed you how he's the only one righteous and you will be judged and cast into hell. Sin, righteousness, judgment. That's what it means in John chapter 16. And unless you confront them about their sin, they are not going to go to heaven. You can't tell people it's okay to be a lesbian, a homosexual, a thief, a reprobate, a drunkard, an extortioner, a fornicator, adultery. There are more people divorced in the church today than outside. I worked with an individual who had been molested by a youth leader in their church. He's actually over a large amount of churches that come together. And they, uh, when they came to the session... The, the two people, they said, now it's like this. If you say anything to anyone, we'll deny it. If you try to push it, we'll have you sued. So you cannot bring charges against this individual. Very interesting how you'll go to a Christian counselor and that's the first thing you tell him. Then I find out that he's been molesting this girl for seven years. He had done the other niece. And now it's on his heart's desire to go adopt more children so that he can begin the molestation over again. Pedophiles are incurable. I said to her, I said, you realize he's not born again. Oh, how dare you say that about my husband? He talked to the pastor and confessed his sins. The pastor should have removed him from his position. And I stand my ground. They hate me. They, they became verbally upset at me and haven't talked to me since. But if you truly love that person, you'll tell them the truth about their sin. You will seek to bring them to salvation. You can't love them into the kingdom. The only way you can get them into the kingdom is by confronting them about their sin and the wages of it. And then leading them to Jesus Christ, the righteous one, and asking for forgiveness. Now you can see why this is the most sobering passage I've ever read. He says, Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Unto the angel of the church in Sardis, in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Once again, this letter is not written to the church. It's written to the pastor in the church of Sardis. So God is telling this pastor, your congregation is Sardis. And this means the red ones. Red ones are those who are not born again. They are washed, not in the blood of Christ, but are covered in their own blood. Isaiah 118 identifies this. He says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, you're covered in your own blood. They shall be made as white as wool. Though you be red like crimson, you shall be as white as snow and you shall be as wool. Esau's name means red and hairy. It means he's got his own covering of hair instead of Christ and he's still covered in his sins. And the Bible says in Malachi, one, two, and three. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet wherein you say have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob. They were twins. And I hated Esau, laid his mountain, his heritage to waste for the dragons. Why? Romans 9.13 gives you a little bit of insight. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Hebrews 12.16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. Esau would go have sex with women that he did not commit to. He wasn't married. Profane means he would speak in filthy ways and about dirty subjects, who for one morsel of wheat, meat sold his birthright. Esau was a pagan. And as a result, he was damned. 
The churches today are filled with fornicators. You say, well, Pastor Tom, how can you say that? Because if you look on a person in lust, you've committed adultery. How many women and men sit and watch shows where people make love? They're naked on screen or partially nude. Your unconscious mind picks up every bit and your frontal lobes, your conscious mind has become seared with a hot iron so you don't even recognize what you're doing. You're taking part in adultery and fornication. It's this generation. Bible says if you look on a person to lust, you've committed adultery. Our generation is filled with adulterers thanks to television, music. Music is some of the filthiest stuff I've ever heard. I don't listen to the music of today. But when I work with people, oftentimes I ask them, I'll say, especially if it's a, a 30 year old or below, I'll say, what, what's your favorite song? I'm shocked sometimes at what I hear. He says in Revelations 1.16 about the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He says in Revelations 1.16, he has in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was like the sun in his strength. Verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels in the seven churches. The seven candlesticks which you saw are the churches. The pastor is in the palm of the hand of Christ. He is the under shepherd. He literally takes his orders from Jesus Christ. He is led by Jesus Christ. He's told where to go by Jesus Christ. The church is not to be run by a board, by deacons, elders. It's to be run by the pastor. Jesus Christ runs the church through the pastor. All this organization is nothing but of the devil. You go back to the Bible, you're going to see the church was small because the pastor had to pray for every person by name every day. He had to give an account for their souls every night before he went to bed. You can't do that with 100 people or more. But yet the church is 90% of the churches are like that. Why? Because people like their anonymity. They don't want to be held accountable. They don't want to open up their heart to a pastor and tell them how it's really going, how the husband, the wife, the children are really living. And you know what? Without having a spiritual covering of a pastor, it's not going to get better. I recently talked to a man, and, and as I'm praying, I hear he has no spiritual covering in my head. You know, the Holy Spirit speaks to us. So I asked him, I said, Tell me about your church. He says, I don't go to church. I said, why? He says, they're all phony these days. They're just out for money. I don't want to be part of that. I said, you understand this pastor is the shepherd. He's that comes between you and the, the wolf. He comes between you and the lion and the bear. God uses him to protect and defend. When somebody's out of the church, they are literally prey for the spiritual world and the spiritual kingdom. Demons will assault and attack that person. They need a pastor's covering. He's anointed by God to take and shield them. We are the ones in Isaiah 11, 1 through 4, that shall come out of the root, the stem of Jesse, and the branch that shall grow out of his roots. It's interesting how this passage begins with, there shall come a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Because this is implying that we will be grafted into him. And here is where the seven spirits of God are discussed. The first is the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Isaiah 11, 1. Ruach Yehovah. This means the spirit of the true God, the one that is self-existing, the one upon everything else is dependent. So it's Ruach Yehovah. We first read in, in Exodus 3, 13 through 14, Moses said, hey, when I go to the children of Israel, say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me. They shall say, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? He said unto Moses, I am that I am. It's the word Hayah. That's where Jehovah comes from, is Hayah. Hayah is the holy name of God, the existing one in the Hebrew. But the most holiest name of God is not Jehovah. It's Eloi. That's the name Jesus used for the Father and the Holy Spirit. Eloi, Eloi, Lambak Saptani, my God. Father, my God, the Holy Spirit, why hast thou ripped apart from me, separated with the sting of death? It means the one from whom all things come to pass. This is who Jesus Christ is, and this is the Spirit of God that's on him. He is the one that controls everything. 
Your God is great. He is bigger than anything you can imagine. So much more grander. Realize when you go to pray to him, you're coming into the room, the majesty, the one who controls all creation. Humble yourself. Have reverence. Verse 3 of chapter 6, he says, And I appeared unto Abraham and Isaac and Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to him, to them. This is where Haya becomes Jehovah or Yehovah. Instead of Haya, it's Yehovah. And it means they didn't know me as their personal deliverer and God. But I am going to give it to you. And that's the spirit, the first spirit listed upon Jesus Christ. He's the personal deliverer, the God that will control and bring everything in your life to pass. You are his servant and slave. He controls every aspect of your life now. Nothing happens by coincidence. Second spirit is the spirit of wisdom, Ruach, Ruach Shakma. It means the one that always chooses, plans, and does everything perfectly to make it complete the way it should be. He works everything out according to his own counsel, and none can sway his hand. That's what that means. Romans 8.28 tells us about Ruach Shachma. It says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. He also has the spirit of understanding. It's Binyah, B-I-Y-N-A-H, Binyah. And this means perfect discernment and understanding. In other words, he knows why things happen around you, why people do things, why you do things. He knows why animals react, why elements react. He knows exactly why everything does what it does. And that's a part of his plan. There's nothing hidden from God. He is the truth. Confess your sins before God. Confess your inaccuracies, your fears, your failures. Give them all to the Lord. He knows and he understands. Praise God he doesn't condemn me for what I do for what I think, for what I don't do. Sins of omission, not doing what you should be doing, is as bad as sins of commission. Let the Lord give us boldness. I try to witness to everyone. My dad was illiterate, but he was one of the smartest men I ever knew. He never got to go to school. And after he got saved, he would witness the best he could, and he was pretty good. And he would confront people and say, why don't you give God one hour? You come to church and give him one hour. He knew that they'd hear the gospel in our church. He knew they'd be confronted of their sin. I had recently a couple, one, a female wanted me to bring, wanted to bring her husband to me for counseling. She says, we're already seeing a pastor of the largest church in town, and it's a Baptist church. She says, I said, well, then why are you wanting to come to me? And she says, well, this pastor is the one for the church assigned to counseling, marriage counseling. And he certified and everything. I said, well, once again, why would you want to switch? She said, because when my husband went, we own a large business. He doesn't go to church, but he does tithe. And she said the first words out of his mouth to the pastor was, I'm a bohemian, which means he'll have sex with anything whenever he wants, animal, human, male, female. He says, I like to go to bars. I like to smoke pot. Do you have a problem with that? And she said she was floored when the marriage counselor said, I am not your enemy. I'm not against you. I am here to bring you together. I'm not here to change you. And she said, her, he said, I will not take sides. I simply want to reconcile and make your marriage better. And she said for two weeks, two, two weeks they've gone. And he's just simply trying to get her to placate and them to live together. Now, sure, they give a lot of money to that church through her ties. She was right. Her husband's soul is more important. That pastor should be confronting him about his sin. He should be confronting him about his need for salvation. He has the spirit of counsel. It's the Ruach Etzah. And it means not just advice or counsel. But he counsels you with a specific purpose for your life. There's a reason why everything is in the Bible. Everything is in God's word, the Bible. There's nothing you can find, say, or do that is not listed in God's word. And it's there for a specific purpose. God wants to control our lives, change our lives. He is Lord over all, or he's not Lord over none. 
I had a person accuse me of being a holder to Lordship Salvation. I said, what is that? And this is 20 years ago. I was pretty much a new Christian. I've only been saved for now 31 years. They said, it's where you think God lords over your whole life, but he doesn't. He gives us the ability to do as we choose and see fit, because once forgiven, we're always forgiven. I said, no, the Bible's very plain. God's commandments are not grievous to those who love him. And he says, why do you say, Lord, Lord, and do not what I ask? Lordship salvation is biblical, whether you like it or not. The uh, person tried to have me brought before the church and kicked out. And their father was one of the head deacons, and they were a very large landowner. Many, I mean, they owned a dozen farms, very wealthy. And uh, it caused a bit of a skirmish in the church. But they couldn't show me biblically where I was incorrect, and the pastor stood by me, so they got rid of the pastor. He has the spirit of might. It's called Ruach Gabor, and this means valor, force, might, and power. He conquers effortlessly 100% of the time. There's nothing that can even stand in his presence. What does that mean? That means when you see him because of the spirit, you fall have no strength, no desire to go against him. That's why when Michael, the greatest of the angels, went against Satan, he didn't try to fight him. He said this to him, and that's all it took. The Lord rebukes thee, Satan. In other words, it's Christ that sent me. Satan turned and left. It's over. Spirit of knowledge. This is different than understanding. Understanding is binya. This is ruach da'ath means perception, complete understanding and knowledge in perception skill. He's able to see what will happen in every circumstance, every situation, before, during, and after. He knows everything that can be. There's nothing that will surprise God. Have you ever wondered and realized nothing occurs to God? He knows everything. And that's what this is talking about. He has the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. And uh, this is, it means dreadful fear. Fear that is so powerful, it, it makes it so that whatever comes in his presence is overwhelmed by his holiness and is unable to do anything but see their own corruption. They themselves want to simply cease to exist because it's so overpowering. In John chapter 18, verse 4, it talks about how when they came to take Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am. He said his holy name. And Judas also, which betrayed them, stood with them. As soon as he said this unto them, I am, they went backwards and fell to the ground. They were flung to the ground because of the spirit of the Lord that was within him. Daniel 10, the entire passage talks about how Daniel didn't even have the strength to rise. He had to say, Daniel, rise. Give him the energy. Verse, uh, the eighth is his alone. It says, he shall make him, speaking of Jesus, verse three, of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And this is the word ruach. It simply means he has the full, there's no measure of the Holy Spirit in Christ. He has the full Holy Spirit it immediately moves at his will faster than thought. He does not judge after the sight of the eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of the ears. But with the righteousness shall he prove, judge the poor, reprove with equity the meek. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He shall slay the wicked. All right, this is part one. We've gotten through the seven spirits and the seven stars. I will finish this letter to Smyrna in the next one. This is Dr. Knotts. I pray that this has blessed you. May the Lord bless you richly in all things as you seek to serve him. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.